On the 26th of December, 1944, Hiro Inada would be sent to the Lubang Island in the Philippines with orders to do everything in his power to stop the advancing Americans. When he landed, it was understood that under no circumstances were the soldiers allowed to take their own life or surrender to the enemy. With these orders and his commitment to the cause, Hiro Inada would engage in guerrilla warfare for close to 30 years after World War II ended. During this time, all efforts to convince Hiro that the war was over would fail. Hiro believed Japan would never surrender, and defeat was only possible when the last Japanese person had been killed. This is the story of Hiro Inada, the man who fought and lived in the jungle for 29 years. In 1939, 17-year-old Hiro Inada would get a job with a local trading company and soon find himself in Wuhan, China. The idea of travelling to Japan-occupied China excited Hiro. To him, a place so large would provide him with endless opportunities if he worked hard enough. When he got to China, the first thing Hiro would do was visit his older brother Toshio, a medical officer stationed on the Manchukuo and Korea border. His brother, surprised to see him, would ask why he would come to China. At this time, Japan was actively invading China. The Rape of Nanking, a massacre which saw the Japanese murder hundreds of thousands of Chinese, had taken place less than two years ago. When his brother asked him if he realised he might be killed in China, Hiro replied, If a man is not prepared to take risks, he will go nowhere. Hiro would continue to work with the trading company during the day, and spend every night off dancing at the French concessions, aware that it was only a matter of time until he was drafted. On December 8th, 1941, the thought of being drafted became a looming reality, when after Pearl Harbor, the war between Japan and the United States officially started. In May of 1942, Hiro was called for his army physical, and soon notified he would be inducted into the 61st Infantry Regiment in Wakayama. Before leaving, he would promise his mother he would come back a first-class private, having no intentions of becoming an officer, or even believing he was cut out for it. Not long into his service, Hiro changed his mind about staying as a private. In part, it was to please his squad leader, but also because he figured if he was going to be sent to war, he might as well fight wearing a flashier uniform. Eventually, Hiro would find himself as an apprentice officer, and was sent to a training center. It is here he would be informed of what the army's intentions for him and the other officers were. When he was first trained, the idea was to simply stay alive and lead their troops to slaughter as many people as possible before they themselves were killed. But this training was different. Now they were being taught in secret warfare and intelligence. But what Hiro was learning went against everything he knew. As a Japanese soldier, if you were to be taken prisoner by the enemy and somehow make it back to Japan, you would be subject to a court-martial and a possible death sentence. Though the death penalty might not be acted out, you could still expect to be exiled from society and bring shame to your family. Now, he was being told that an even greater sacrifice could be made. Rather than die fighting with perceived honour, he could decide to allow himself to be captured. When captured, he could feed the enemy false information and gather intelligence. However, if he were to survive, those on the inside of the operation would know of his sacrifice, but the whole of Japan would believe him to be a coward. Despite being a thankless job, Hiro enjoyed the training and thought it suited his personality. After graduating, Hiro and 21 others would be given orders to the Utsunomiya airfield, and with what he had learned still fresh in his mind, he would tell his mother, My work being what it is, it's possible that I may be reported dead when I'm not. If you're told I've been killed, don't think too much about it, because I may well show up again after a few years. Not long after, Hiro would be sent to the Japanese headquarters in the Philippine capital of Manila, and would hear these fateful words. Apprentice Officer Onada will proceed to Lubang Island, where he will lead the Lubang garrison in guerrilla warfare. His objective would be to hamper enemy attacks on the island of Luzon by destroying an airfield and pier at the harbour. It would be in these headquarters he would commit himself to fulfilling his order no matter the cost. After receiving his orders, Hiro would stop by the division depot and acquire dynamite, landmines, hand grenades, and a camouflage uniform before spending the rest of the night studying maps of the island. Only 24 hours later, Hiro was on a boat, and by the early hours of the morning, Lubang Island would appear on the horizon. When he arrived, he would meet with Lieutenant Hayakawa at the foot of Mount Ambulong and hand him the orders he had been given. The lieutenant's response would shock him. After he finished reading the order, he gave Hiro a puzzled look and asked, Didn't they mean boats? It dawned on Hiro there had been a miscommunication. 
The message instructing the lieutenant that Hiro was coming to direct guerrilla warfare had used a standard word in Japanese that meant not only warfare, but in another context could also be interpreted as boats. The lieutenant's interpretation of the message was nothing more than wishful thinking that Hiro was here to take them off the island with guerrilla boats. Those in front of him were not preparing to fight, they were preparing to escape and had already secured 10 smaller boats in the process. On January 3rd, 1945, at 8.30 in the morning, a lookout at the top of the mountain would send a message down. The Allies had been sighted. Hero would count two battleships, four aircraft carriers, four cruisers, and a mixture of destroyers and light cruisers totaling 38 warships. What astounded him more than this incredible fleet was the number of troop transports and landing craft which he estimated at over 150. The ships were headed towards the island of Luzon, but Hiro feared part of the force he was seeing would break off and assault the island of Lubang. Two days after this sighting, a message would be sent from the division headquarters stating all soldiers were to report to division command. What this meant is, despite being trained and instructed to lead a troop in guerrilla warfare, Hiro could no longer issue any orders. With no real authority, the soldiers around Hiro began to speak of committing suicide and giving their lives for the Emperor. Real examples of this would take place on the nearby island of Luzon, where Japanese soldiers in small wooden motorboats full of explosives would ram themselves into American ships with the intent to sacrifice themselves and cause the most damage possible. These men were a part of the 15th and 16th advanced squad, and not long after the attack and assault on Luzon, they would arrive in Lubang, hoping to flank the enemy American forces. The squads consisted of a combined 40 men who arrived with no food or supplies, forcing Hiro and his garrison to divide their supplies of rice even further. As days passed, Hiro's attempts to persuade the garrison to commit to guerrilla warfare failed, leaving him feeling powerless and frustrated. It was not long after that that they would finally face the enemy. On February 28th, 1945, 50 American soldiers landed west of the island. From the mountaintops, the Japanese soldiers watched the Americans move forward cautiously through the beach. In comparison to the vast fleet they had witnessed, having to deal with only 50 American soldiers filled some of the men with confidence. But to Hiro, something didn't seem right. Surely this small number had to be a trick. Hiro voiced his concerns to Lieutenant Suhiro and urged him to wait and see what would happen. Ignoring Hiro, the lieutenant took 15 men with him to hunt the Americans down. Hiro and the remaining men prepared their defences, and by night, a maintenance crew that had been left at the airfield returned. They told Hiro the lieutenant had tried to persuade them to stay, but they thought it was too dangerous and came back into the mountains. Only 30 minutes later, the soldiers in the mountains would see flames rising in the distance, and they were sure the lieutenant had run into enemy fire. As dawn broke, the sun gave visuals to a light cruiser and three more troop transports heading toward the island. Soon the naval ships and aircraft began bombarding the island with explosives as the troop transports neared their landing. While watching this from the mountains, a soldier who was with the lieutenant would crawl up the mountain. The soldier reported Hero's assumption was correct, the lieutenant had engaged with the enemy, and all but the men reporting to him had been killed. As American troops landed with mortars and tanks accompanying them, Hero thought this would be the best time to engage in guerrilla warfare, but again, the soldiers refused. When the enemy shells began to fall, Hero ordered those who were wounded but could walk to move further into the mountains. Picking out six of the strongest looking men, he ordered them to carry as many supplies as they could, and they began moving. Not even 30 minutes later, enemy fire could be heard from the direction that Hero and his men were moving. Hero ordered a lookout to move ahead of the troop, but not long after, he would come back limping with a bullet wound to his leg. The first American troop to land was behind them, and in front of them, mortars were raining down. They were trapped, but continued to move, only to find a bloodied path with two Japanese soldiers lying on their stomach. Hiro called to them to creep forward, but instead one stood up. Instantly a shot rang out and the man fell forward. The bullet had hit him in the head. Hiro shouted to the second man to stay down as he crawled toward a ditch. As Hiro made it to the ditch, the soldier rose to his feet and ran toward it, jumping into it as a bullet flew past. Hiro slid back down into cover, only to realise moments later, his hand was covered in blood. The bullet had ripped off the tip of his little finger, leaving only a small piece of nail. By night, two lieutenants had been killed by mortar shells, and an additional two were missing and presumed dead. 
With no commanding officers, Hiro and the other soldiers had lost all organization and were starting to move as individuals. Hiro devised a plan to retreat to a mountain range covered in dense forest where they could double back to their former base and collect supplies they had hidden and then once again return to the forest. Word had come from nearby Captain Suki promising to bring his squad to Hiro, but the remaining men would offer little to help. They had no weapons. Hiro and the other men would spend another night under mortar fire waiting for Captain Suki before deciding they could wait no longer. With 15 men, Hiro set out to attack the American troops blocking their retreat. Having failed to convince his troop to destroy the Air Force and Harbor Pier, it was now in full use by the Americans. With these failures in mind, Hiro's mind reverted back to his previous suicidal training, and as night fell, he prepared to descend upon the American camp. By the time they reached the camp, the Americans had already identified Hiro's plan and retreated. Returning to their base, they would wait, and Captain Suki and his men would finally arrive. Ready to once again check their path of retreat, Hiro would be about to leave the base when a messenger approached him. The messenger, speaking on behalf of the sick tent, requested explosives. The sick and wounded men, totaling 21, saw no other way out than suicide, and intended to use the explosives to achieve it. Hiro would grant their wish on one condition. If they were committed to ending their lives, at the very least, they could wait to use the explosives rigged to their tent until they spotted the enemy. For them, it did not matter if they died, but for the others still willing to fight, they wanted to know if they could return to the camp, which still held their food supplies. If the men used the explosives upon seeing the enemy, rather than just to commit suicide, then at least they would act as a warning that Hiro and his men could not return to the camp. Later, Hiro would return to the spot, but find no trace of the tent or the men. All that remained was a gaping hole in the ground. Over time, additional skirmishes would see the remaining captain and lieutenants killed, and Hiro would quickly become the only officer on the island. Eventually, the remaining soldiers would split into cells consisting of three to four people. Hiro would end up with Corporal Shimada and Private Kazuka. They would continue to camp in the forest, and after weeks of quiet, in the middle of May 1945, they would hear the familiar sound of mortars. One of the groups had been surrounded and gunned down. This would be the last organized attack on the Japanese survivors hiding in the mountains. By October, a group of Japanese soldiers were confronted by villagers while stealing one of their cows. When the Japanese pulled out their guns, the villagers would flee, but one would leave behind a leaflet that would be distributed throughout the forest. In Japanese, it would read, The war ended on August 15th. Come down from the mountains. At first, no one believed it. Even a few days prior to these leaflets, another group of Japanese soldiers stealing another cow had been fired upon by a patrol. Reasoning that this would not happen if the war was over, the groups continued to live on the slopes of the mountains. Though these remaining groups stayed in contact, Hiro refused to tell them where he was camped and continued to focus on the idea of guerrilla warfare by studying the terrain so he could be useful when the Japanese army launched a counterattack. Enemy patrols of the mountains stopped by the middle of August, but Hiro could still hear shots frequently around the lower parts, leading him to believe the enemy had now decided to starve them out. By the end of 1945, a second set of flyers would be dropped from a Boeing B-17. Printed on the front page was a surrender order, and on the back, a map of the island. The wording on the surrender order mentioned a direct imperial order, something Hiro, nor a soldier who had gone through law school, had ever heard of. This only made them more suspicious of the flyers and more confident in the assessment these were enemy tricks aimed at forcing them out. These suspicions would become validated further in February of 1946, when three Japanese soldiers were hunting for food in the mountainside and unknowingly stumbled upon a camp full of Filipino soldiers. Started at the sight of the Japanese, the Filipinos thought they were being attacked and immediately opened fire, killing two of the three men. A soldier by the name of Akatsu who had been camping with some of the men killed by the Filipinos now found himself alone and attempted to join Hiro and his group. Hiro didn't think too much of him, thinking of him as a weakling, and he had become tired of members from other groups approaching him for food. By March, more leaflets would drop, which read, Nobody is searching for you now but Japanese. Come on out. More of the Japanese soldiers grew tired of hiding in the mountains and eventually surrendered. After surrendering, they would return as part of the search parties, calling out to Hiro, but in his mind, they were being forced to do so by the enemy. Hearing the former soldiers plead to him to surrender became a regular occurrence, and only caused Hiro to continue moving locations. By April 1946, the leaflets continued to fall, 
and the remaining four men, Shimada, Kazuku, Akatsu, and Hiro, begin to debate if the war had actually ended. Hiro would offer to surrender, taking only hand grenades with him, and telling the remaining men if he were to return, they would know the war had ended, but if he didn't, then he would have used his hand grenades to commit suicide. This offer of sacrifice would be enough for the men to vow not to surrender and continue fighting. At the time of their vow, Shimada was 31, Kazuka 25, Akatsu 23, and Hiro 24. Between them, each had an infantry rifle, a mine, a 99 rifle, three 38 caliber handguns, and two grenades. Over time, they developed a circuit they would move along, avoiding staying in one place for more than five days. At times, they would encounter villagers who they would shoot at to scare away, and steal rice left by those working in the mountains. By September 1949, four years after the group had come together, they would have their first deserter. Akatsu had disappeared three times before his final desertion. Each time before, Shimada had been able to find him and bring him back. It wasn't a surprise that he had deserted, and Hiro had suspected he was not willing to stick it out, which led him to keeping important information from Akatsu, such as where they stored their ammunition. The secrecy was on such a level that Hiro would take Akatsu hunting so the other men could move supplies without him knowing. This was all done to keep their supplies safe when Akatsu left. On the fourth and final time he disappeared, the men now confident Akatsu could not give any meaningful information to the enemy decided not to follow him. What Hiro didn't know at the time was Akatsu spent an additional six months alone in the mountains before finally surrendering. Ten months after his desertion, almost midway into 1949, the group would find a letter written by Akatsu, saying, When I surrendered, the Philippine troops greeted me as a friend. Still skeptical and unwilling to surrender, the troops would be given a more direct ultimatum. On the day after finding the note Akatsu had written, a Japanese voice projected by a loudspeaker would say, Yesterday we dropped leaflets from an airplane. You have three days, that is 72 hours, in which to surrender. In the event that you do not surrender in that time, we will probably have no alternative but to send a task force after you. Though this message was spoken in perfect Japanese, the men reasoned no Japanese person would refer to three days as 72 hours and was just an impressive translation by the enemy. In three days time, the group would spot the task force which consisted of five Filipino soldiers and one Japanese man. Though unable to know for certain, they were sure the man with these soldiers was a katsu. Hiro and the others were confident they could hold their own against a group of 50 men with the knowledge they had of the mountains, but there was something they feared. If the enemy was to use gas, they would have no way of defending themselves. And so, for six months after seeing the task force, they would carry towels tied to their canteen straps as makeshift gas masks. Their paranoia was so great that they considered villagers in the mountain to be the enemy, or spies in disguise, and would fire on them. The subsequent search parties after their attacks on villagers would cement their belief that these were in fact enemy troops. But there were also signs that the war was in fact over. Over a six year period, Hiro noticed villagers left food behind more often and would find worn out clothing around the foot of the mountains. This was a clear sign to Hiro that living conditions on the island had improved. If this wasn't enough of a sign, they would see something much more credible. After six years, Shimada, while out on patrol, would come back excited and lead Hiro and Kazuka up a small hill. On this hill, for the first time since they'd been on the island, they would see electric lights. The last time either of them had seen anything resembling electricity had been six years prior. This wouldn't be the only thing. Soon the harbour would fill with large civilian transport ships, and popular Filipino songs of the time would float from their speakers into the mountains surrounding them. Seeing all of this after so long, you would think Hiro would feel homesick, but he felt nothing at all, even wondering if he could feel anything after all this time. In February 1952, a light aircraft would fly over the mountain, calling their names from a speaker and dropping more leaflets. Among these leaflets was a letter from Hiro's older brother Toshio. The letter read, I am entrusting this letter to Lieutenant Colonel Kimbo, who is going to the Philippine Islands on invitation of Madame Roxas. The letter would go on to say the war had ended, Hiro's parents were well, and all of his brothers were out of the army. There were also letters from Kazuka and Shimada's families, including photographs. Not even these photos could convince the men that the war was in fact over, and only served in aiding more complex layers to the Americans' trickery. More time would pass with more newspapers being dropped and Japanese journalists attempting to contact the men without success. In June 1953, the men would come across a camp of 15 village fishermen in a part of the mountains they rarely saw anyone in. 
With the rainy season approaching, meaning they could not move as freely if they were discovered, Hero and his men fired on the fishermen. Upon being fired on, the fishermen scattered, but one armed with a rifle took cover behind a boulder. As the group moved through a path to attack him from behind, they revealed themselves to another fisherman who was startled and armed with a carbine. He shot at the men before fleeing, and one of these bullets hit Hiro's ring finger. Another went through Shimada's right leg. The group would be forced to retreat and spend over 40 days nursing Shimada's injury until he could walk again. Though it had healed, Shimada could no longer move as freely as he used to, and on May 7th, 1954, the group would run into trouble. Only half a mile from where Shimada had been shot, the group would see a search party of over 30 men. Unable to move through the mountains, the group decided to stay in their place with Shimada. The next morning, Hiro and Kazuka slept while Shimada stood watch. When they woke, they saw Shimada standing in the valley with his gun aimed. There was a villager moving down toward their location. Hiro took aim and fired two shots, causing the men to scream and hide behind a rock. Hiro dropped to the ground and Kazuka took cover behind a tree. In seconds, another shot rung out, and Shimada slumped forward. Hiro had fired on the men, believing the enemy to be in the valley near Shimada, but they were located on the slope across from them in the direction Shimada had been aiming. Hiro's shot had alerted them to their position, and contributed to Shimada's death. In the days following, the search party would leave behind newspapers with an article revealing Shimada had been shot between the eyebrows, and the people they believed to be a search party were actually members of the Philippine army practicing drills. The mistakes made resulting in Shimada's death would play on the remaining two men's minds, but the one thing Hiro couldn't understand was why Shimada had stayed standing in the open among the enemy. Ten days after Shimada's death, a Philippine Air Force plane would pass over the mountain several times with the banner reading, Unada, Kazuka, the war has ended. But all this would do was add to their rage. Trekking along the mountains, they would find fragments of Japanese supplies, such as tent poles and backpacks. This coupled with the act of air bombing taking place in a nearby valley led the men to believe there were more Japanese soldiers hiding throughout the island. With all of this going on, the leaflets started dropping more frequently, convincing the men that the Japanese army was regaining enough strength to take the island, and the Americans were desperate for them to surrender. One leaflet in particular would strike Kazuka as odd. It contained a photo of Kazuka's family outside of a new home. Kazuka didn't understand how they expected him to believe the photo to be real when the house was in their family home. At the time, he had no knowledge of the atomic and fire bombing that had taken place and did not know his old family home had been reduced to rubble and ash. With photos not being enough, both Hiro and Kazuka's little brothers would call out to them from a loudspeaker. From a distance hidden in the mountains, Hiro and Kazuka caught sight of the men, and even though they looked and sounded almost identical to their brothers, because they were, they still refused to believe they were not impersonators. To give you an idea of what frame of mind you have to be in to be this committed, at the time Hiro arrived in the Philippines, the phrase, 100 million souls dying for honor, was spoken by almost every Japanese person. It meant quite literally that the entire population of Japan would die before surrendering. So in Hiro's own words, I sincerely believed that Japan would not surrender so long as one Japanese remained alive. Conversely, if one Japanese were left alive, Japan could not have surrendered. If necessary, the women and children would resist with bamboo sticks trying to kill as many enemy troops as they could before being killed themselves. This was a sentiment Kazuka agreed with in its entirety. With these ideas and this commitment to their oath, they would continue their guerrilla warfare, firing on villages and burning their crops to signal any friendly troops that they were in the area. With nothing but time, they would stagger these attacks in different areas over months or years. In one instance, they would even ambush a middle-aged farmer and take him to the mountains to interrogate for information. In 1965, they would fire on another set of villagers and enter their cabin to find a transistor radio. For the first year, they would only use it to listen to news and continue to power it by firing upon other villagers with flashlights and stealing their batteries. Even with this news, they selectively believed what they wanted to, such as the Tokyo Olympic Games taking place, and labelled other things as misinformation. In 1966, while carrying a cow they had stolen from a villager, Kazuka stood on a thorn and injured his foot. The next day, his entire leg swelled up, and after a week, the swelling went down. But while on a hike to a location they had hidden batteries, Kazuka would fall to the ground. Kazuka would be bedbound in their makeshift hut during the rainy season, and during this time teach Hiro about horse racing. 
Kazuka would eventually recover, and the two would continue their small raids against the islanders and skirmishes with local police. On October 19th, 1972, Kazuka and Hiro would decide to conduct another one of their fire raids on the rice farms. The men fired shots into the air to scare the villagers away from their crops. When they got to the crops, Kazuka grabbed a nearby straw mat to use for a fire, and Hiro checked a nearby pot for food. As Hiro took the pot off the branch it was hanging from, he heard gunshots from both sides. The men dived for their guns, Hiro grabbed his and took a knee to aim. Kazuka dropped into the dirt and tried reaching for his gun, but blood poured from his shoulder. Hiro ordered Kazuka to head back down into the valley of the mountain, and turned toward the direction of the gunfire. Two figures emerged from the darkness, screaming and shooting automatic weapons at the men. Hiro returned four shots and the two figures broke off. With a pause in the firefight, Hiro grabbed both rifles and turned to retreat. When he turned, he saw Kazuka still on the ground, now clutching his heart. It's my chest. It's no use, Kazuka groaned. Seconds later, blood foam spewed from his mouth and he fell forward. Hiro called to him, but it was no use. Kazuka was dead. Hiro hurried back into the safety of the forest as gunfire continued behind him. After 28 years in the mountain, Hiro was now alone. Hiding in the trees, Hiro promised himself if he were to encounter anyone he deemed as an enemy, he would shoot to kill. Only three days after Kazuka's death, another search party would enter the forest, pleading for Hiro to come out. A month after Kazuka's death, Hiro would confront an islander on his way home from work. The men would flee, and another search party would be issued. But this time would be different. From a loudspeaker, he would hear a familiar voice. Hiro, you gave me two, didn't you? It was his older sister. She was referring to the two pearls he had given her on her wedding day. From another direction, his older brother called to him. For the first time, he believed the voices did belong to his brother and sister. Intrigued and with enough food to last him, Hiro decided to wait and watch the party. Despite this, he still did not come out, and 45 days after Kazuka's death, he would return to where he'd been killed, intending to say a prayer. Here, he would find a book with the rising sun on the cover. Inside, he would find a message in his brother's handwriting, reading, You probably have things to say to me before we talk together. Tear out the flyleaf and write them down on it. If you leave it here, I'll receive it. Hiro would continue forward and find a large tombstone with the words, Death Place of Army Private First Class Kazuka. After reading the words, Hiro would vow to avenge his death. Three months after Kazuka's death, the loudspeakers continued, but Hiro, having heard on his radio about the Americans failing Vietnam War, started to believe Japan had sent the search party, but he believed they didn't actually want to find him. In his mind, finding him was their excuse to survey the island and potentially bring the Philippines to their side. So if he did reveal himself, he would be ruining their excuse to be on the island. Six months after Kazuka's death, Hiro would return to his mountain hut to find a poem written by his father had been left inside. It read, Not even an echo responds to my call in the summery mountains. With the search party still looking for him, the added labour of surviving on his own, and the idea that the Japanese and Philippines may now be allies, his plans for attack were stalled. On February 20th, 1974, Hiro made his way toward the river to gather jackfruit when he spotted a tent. Believing these to be policemen, now camping between him and food, Hiro committed to attacking them. Moving forward, he caught sight of a man near the river. Hiro raised his gun and called out to him. When the man turned around, he saluted Hiro, and with shaking hands, told him he was Japanese. Hiro asked the man if he was sent by the Japanese government. The man said no, he was a tourist. The man then told Hiro the war had ended, and asked him to come back with him to Japan. Angered by this, after all the years he had spent fighting, to just be asked by this man, Hiro responded, I won't go back. For me, the war hasn't ended. In front of Hiro was a young man by the name of Norio Suzuki, and luckily for Norio, Hiro considered him to be Japanese, partly for his mannerisms and partly because he was wearing socks with sandals, something Hiro didn't believe an islander would do. Norio offered him a cigarette and Hiro accepted. Still suspicious, Hiro only agreed to speak with him in the mountains. As they spoke, Norio asked if he could take Hiro's photo to prove to the embassy that they had spoken. For the now 52-year-old Hiro, who had spoken with only three people for close to 28 years and been completely alone for a year, it was comforting to speak to someone else. During their conversation, Norio and Hiro agreed the only way he could surrender was if the Major who had given the orders for guerrilla warfare came to Lubang and gave him direct orders to stand down. With the agreement that Norio would bring Hiro's Major to Lubang, the two parted ways. 
Two weeks later, Hero would check a message box, which had been set up by search parties and become the agreed upon method of communication. Inside was a message from Norio. I've come back for you, just as I promised. Inside were two copies of two army orders and a photo the two had taken together. Oral orders between the two were set to take place, and Hiro decided after all these years it was time to take a chance. The next day, Major Taniguchi would give Hiro his orders to stand down. Hiro would visit Kazuka's grave before a helicopter took them off Lubang Island. As he looked down on the island from above, he couldn't help but wonder why he had been fighting for so long, and who it had been for. Hiro Inada had killed several people not mentioned in this story during his 30 years. Despite this, the Filipino president, Ferdinand Marcos, would grant him a full pardon for the actions he had taken against the residents on Lubang Island. On his return to Japan, Hiro would be offered a large sum of money from the Japanese government, but refused to accept it. He was also reported to have been unhappy with the amount of attention he received, and believed it to be caused by the dying traditional Japanese values. In April 1975, he would leave Japan and move to Brazil to raise cattle but after reading about a Japanese teenager who murdered his parents, he would return to Japan to establish Unada Nature School, an educational camp for young people. On January 16th, 2014, at the age of 91, Hiro Unada would pass away from heart failure and complications due to pneumonia, 